First of all, I would like, uh, before I start, last year I gave a presentation here as well, the seminar, and uh, the Mike and Mike uh, just processed this. Uh, this year we have a new book that we make available for all the people here. But of course, the most important thing is that the students they, who are here as well today and who will this year be in a joint uh, course with your students, with the Brazilian students, that they made um, a good job last year, and we hope you will this year as well. And we made a book like it. So, and I would like to offer you the book. Uh, this is the first, uh, not formal, but the first handover of the first book of uh, Smart Industries and uh, Mobility uh, book of 2014, of course. It's really an amazing uh, amount of work, and it's worthwhile uh, looking through it. And we also gave it to all the lecturers today uh, here by the room. So, please, uh, thanks a lot for your, uh, for your help with this amazing uh, exchange. Thank you. Of course, I think, and all the other lecturers will also get some. They might think, what's in this bag? But that's a typical Dutch stroke bow. Oh. <laughs> and we give that together with the books as well uh, to you because uh, they might be a bit, um, due to the sun, they're a bit uh, united into one. <laughs> okay. But it's um, okay. Today I will actually, um, as I showed in my previous slide, um, uh, my title is the Intelligent Green Blue for Sustainable Attractive Cities and I, I hope that we can contribute to the uh, that we can contribute to, contribute to the um, to Sao Paulo uh, region and especially to the with our course to the green and especially the blue uh, uh, infrastructure in this, uh, in this amazing city but today I will also um, put a lot of emphasis on in the word intelligent or smart so my lecture will be on that uh, focusing, especially. So my background, um, as was told before, is from TU Delft and from AMS. And I would like to tell a bit about smart cities, because smart cities, it's a bit of a buzzword. It's being used and misused all over, um, you might say, the world. Not only by cities, but also for smart infrastructures, smart grids, smart devices, and so forth. And, but it's something we cannot, uh, we cannot leave uh, uh, out of, the, out of the picture. So, to start with, I will start with a little movie. It's in Dutch, but it's in subtitles in English. So, it might. Uh... Sorry. De bottomlijn hier is wat maakt de bewoners van de stad gelukkig. Mensen bepalen of de stad leeft anders. Het gaat altijd om de perceptie van de, de bewoners. Wordt wel eens gezegd, de mensen maken de stad, maar eigenlijk uh, de mensen zijn de stad. We staan hier op het dak van het uh, Amy gebouw van uh, TU Delft. Uh, het zijn allemaal verschillende soorten radars die uh, hier op het dak staan. Die worden gebruikt voor onderzoek. Uh, onder andere onderzoek uh, om beter uh, weergegevens te meten, met name neerslag. Waar we naartoe willen is echt metingen op straatniveau. Dus echt elke 100 meter. Een meting van de neerslag en dan ook nog eens veel nauwkeuriger dan wat er nu beschikbaar is. Ja, we hebben in de afgelopen jaren enorm veel onderzoek gedaan naar verplaatsingsgedrag. Maar wat we nu zien, wat echt heel erg in opkomst is, dat zijn allerlei nieuwe technologieën. En die nieuwe technologieën die gaan een enorm impact hebben op onze toekomst. Het is duidelijk geworden dat wij niet winnaar van het natuurlijk systeem. En dat houdt in dat wij nog steeds natuurlijk alle techniek in huis hebben om alles te doen. Maar wij willen wel weer graag ja, adaptief zijn ten aanzien van dat natuurlijk systeem. Ja, en dat is een worsteling, want ja, wat doe je niet en wat doe je wel? En dat, daar zitten we middenin. Wat we doen is het vertalen van open data naar gegevens. Van gegevens en informatie en naar beelden, kaartbeelden die dan te gebruiken zijn om de oplossing in te starten. Stad als lichaam, ja, het is een fantastische uh, metafoor. Kan je je voorstellen van wat voor ja, input er allemaal in gaat, water, energie, eh, materialen. Maar dat we ook net als mensen eh, vaak te veel willen eten, te veel willen snoepen. En dat is ook het probleem van de stad eigenlijk. We zijn een beetje energieverslaafd. Wat nu verandert is de manier waarop we onze steden vergrijpen, maar ook hoe we realtime kunnen reageren op veranderingen in gebruik. Dit is het gevolg van nieuwe kansen die ontstaan op het kruispunt van het fysieke en het digitale domein, en dan met name in de steden. 
Dit geeft kans voor meer duurzame en meer efficiënte steden, maar ook voor meer leefbaarheid en voor meer betrokkenheid van de inwoners van steden. In feite staat de samenleving op een omslagpunt. Hoe organiseren wij de alomtegenwoordigheid van ICT en van stille systemen in de steden? Vooral in de steden liggen er enorm veel kansen en ook bedreigingen. Intelligente steden zijn het antwoord, maar wat is de vraag? We want to introduce smart infrastructures. Uh, we want to create smart cities. Um, what's the question? What's the, what is the, uh, and most of it, of course, will be related to um, effectiveness, making cities more effective, or uh, technology more effective, or uh, more uh, custom, uh, uh, custom made for, for use, user users. But it's very important also that it, it helps address, of course, to uh, real time uh, 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 solving of, uh, of change. And this is the perspective of our chair as well, and of our, uh, of our group in, uh, in Delft. So we have this two-fold two perspective, which is on the one hand the natural system, on the other hand the, uh, the human system. And uh, from this uh, dual perspective we hope to get a 3D um, uh, view on how to change and uh, improve uh, cities in its effectiveness and above all in sustainability. But it's actually urban growth, of course, which makes that smart systems most of all have been, uh, that have been introduced. Um, this is an example of Hong Kong, uh, an amazing uh, picture. And Hong Kong, its footprint, its spatial footprint actually is uh, 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 it's of a certain amount and, and actually it needs 2200 times that spatial footprint to support that city with water, with food, with uh, energy. So that's amazing. So we need this, uh, this reciprocity of uh, city and hinterlands. This is uh, Shanghai, it's a similar uh, way, and in Sao Paulo it's also the same. So we could say that urbanization is in a way in a crisis. Eh? We, are, we are urbanizing very fast, uh, but it's in a crisis. Eh? So it's a country of France, the population of the country of France, in one month, every month again, which is uh, increasing the urban areas in the world. And of course it leads to a lot of amazing uh, pictures, like Dubai, 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 Dubai Strip, Marina. And, uh, but it also leads to uh, what some calls that there's a change, there's a shift from nation, uh, an organization in the world by nation states, into city states. Again. So the scale of organization is changing. And also it's sometimes addressed to as from after the Pleistocene and the Holocene, we are now in the Anthropocene, so in the age of man. And so the, the city's power is, uh, is increasing, but also is that of uh, ourselves. So this is why I introduced the book uh, Ubiquity, which is available for all of you. I think the Dutch students already have it. So please get one if you want. And um, you might say it is misspelled. It's Ubiquity without a K, but this is on purpose, actually. Uh, so this is uh, Ubiquity, which means uh, without a K means everywhere. And it's about big data, of course. But Ubik is a very famous um, science fiction novel from uh, my age uh, of birth. Of birth. 1969, and it's actually uh, I use it actually as a uh, as a metaphor for uh, the global infrastructure and ecology of the ICTs, but also in, in kind of absolute faith in technology. So that's the, 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 the downside, you might say. And you will uh, I will explain that a bit more today. It's about techno austerity. So uh, like this image. Yeah? So how do you tip a, a robot? But it's also about futures of uh, generations, like you are sitting here. And uh, this generation is um, often being addressed to as a hobo, but um, I uh, changed it into a crowbo because you are creative hobos in a way. So it's actually a generation which is um, suffering uh, lately more difficulties in getting fixed contracts and get, getting fixed uh, positions in, in work, but also it's starting in uh, like the hobos are uh, working. This new generations have um, another way of culture, so you move more around the world. So uh, it supports actually this movement from nation states to city states. And there's also a lot of insecurity around it. So if we're talking about prosperity, what is the difference? What does prosperity mean, to, uh, mean today? And it's uh, very interesting to, to see that uh, you in Habitat who defined this, uh, this prosperity 
by five uh, indicators which they use in, um, the, uh, in their city prosperity index. And um, up to 2012, in November, they always used the triple P approach, the people, planet, and prosperity approach. And actually, it's interesting that the three keys are still in, but actually, there's a new um, additional indicator which they add, which is the infrastructure. And it's very interesting with development, actually. So, this is interesting. So, your connectivity, your ubiquity, your, uh, your connectivity with the world makes actually your prosperity uh, grow uh, according to your, your habitat. And this is, of course, also internal infrastructures like the essentials for water, energy, and so forth. So it's becoming an essential uh, dimension in, uh, in urban life. At the same time, being planners, being architects and urban planners, is also a paradigm. That is that in constructing cities, we start with infrastructures and afterwards we let the city grow. Well, actually, originally, the, the cities like they, they grew in, in the street mostly were the other way around. They also uh, um, they started around the infrastructures, but afterwards, growth made the infrastructure. And this is a bit uh, of a problem. This is what we call a planning paradigm. So in the, in the late 70s, there was um, a stack being created by Jung Christensen, and he built this stack uh, based on the work of the ecologist uh, Odu, a uh, famous ecologist. And Jung Christensen actually divided uh, the world, because our system, our, our living system, into an abiotical system, a biotical system, a technical system, which is cities, infrastructure, and so forth, and a physical system. So it's a very simple way of uh, organization. Four layers in our, is our, it's our environment. It's, uh, now, last year, uh, Benjamin Breton came with the stack, which actually needed a further elaboration on this, on this work by Odum and by Christensen. And it's actually related to smart devices, to how we are living at the moment, how we are changing our, our lifestyles. So, so uh, and it's actually trying to get grasp on how we become footloose. Yeah, so we are an IP address, yeah, so we are actually uh, uh, not a fixed uh, uh, point in a, in a physical scale, but it's actually something which is moving. So it's a user interface, address, network, city, cloud, and earth, subdivision of this technical state. Why is this important? Because this also is related to this, uh, this changing uh, limitations of city and city growth. But at the same time, it's very important also to state that cities throughout the centuries, the strongest cities, which still are considered the strongest cities at this moment, are cities like London, Singapore, and uh, Paris. And those are still cities which actually always have supported the maximum into innovation, into infrastructure. They always have uh, invested, uh, like the Baron Heisman uh, access, but also in London uh, lately in smart city. So in a way, this is dilemma. And of course, there's this, this, this development of uh, what I call uh, fashions. Yeah? So it's, uh, it was for a time a sustainable city, was a fashion, a creative city by Richard Florida, the, the just city, the healthy city by uh, the Canadian. And, uh, and now there is this smart city. So, what is a smart city? Uh, at the moment, smart cities are uh, uh, popping up all around the world, or at least cities that consider themselves as smart. It actually started in 2008, and this was, uh, curiously enough, uh, exactly the year in which the global crisis started. And uh, just one month before this, uh, after this um, global crisis, the IBM CEO, Khalid uh, uh, Mano, he gave a speech and he said, um, we have a solution for this crisis. Cities should become smart. And they uh, introduced this Smarter Cities movement in uh, at first in the United States with this uh, nice uh, externals, of course, but they also uh, had a secondary effect, uh, a secondary uh, uh, strategy, you might say, because they offered their, their services for free in many cities. And uh, at the moment, this is about uh, 2,400 cities worldwide. They offer their services for free. But of course, it's not for free, because in the end, now they are already via uh, the selling of their products, they already gain about 30% of their total revenue, annual revenue, by their technology. So it's actually, it is a big business, you might say. And Anthony Townsend, a famous uh, writer about smart cities, and also in favor of uh, the smart city movement, actually he states, 
cities, smart cities are made to make uh, to, to, to repair the dumb designs of the past. Eh? So like this kind of possibilities, like a tram lane combined with a sewerage. This is impossible, as you might imagine. And so the, the smart cities are actually uh, there to, to repair those kinds of mistakes by us engineers, urban engineers. Be it in water, be it in mobility, be it in sanitation, be it in energy infrastructure. So, smart cities in general are depending on these six subgroups. Eh? So, it's about a smart economy, it's about the way we pay, the way we move, the mobility, the way we live, the governance is actually uh, uh, part of focus, and the smart environment. Which has to do also with climate change, adaptation uh, strategies, and the way uh, we organize ourselves as smart people. So, just to give you, because I have very limited, limited time, you can read it more in detail in the book, I give you some examples of what are considered best practices of best of smart cities in the world. These are uh, considered the best practices. And, uh, also, to give you a bit of a, yeah, a view that it's not that smart at all. Uh, this is Songdo, this is in Seoul. South Korea. This is next to uh, uh, a new town, you might say, next to uh, Seoul. In South Korea, is already uh, a society which is quite developed as for technology. Yeah? So they, they are actually uh, adoption of technology in South Korea is, is quite uh, uh, um, uh, uh, advanced in comparison to Europe or to South America. And uh, but they do actually they just uh, they have sensors uh, all around the place. They sense mobility movements, they have sensing in the wastewater systems, in the waste management systems, in the energy generation. In the schools, the kids are sensed and they try actually to, to bring this all together and to actually give advice to the users to become more comfortable or more uh, effective in their living. But the interesting thing is about some do, sorry, is that actually there has been a lot of research. So why? Uh, because in the beginning people didn't move to the town, right? so it was a uh, about 20% of all the houses you saw here were, uh, were used by, by people. And the other 80%, they were not used, they were empty. And uh, then after some time it started running and now it's, it's going quite well. But actually, the social um, analysis, the, 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 the surveys they did, they brought into, uh, they, they made clear that uh, people didn't move because of its smartness in this town, but they moved here because of its it's, uh, um, it's rest, so the, 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 the green environments and the few people who are living there. So that's, a, that's an interesting thing. So people do not start living there because of more comfort or more smart. But I will come to that later. Another city considered as a smart city is Mastar City in uh, Dubai. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, in Abu Dhabi, sorry. And um, Mastar City, this is, a, this is a model, but it's also uh, how it's being built now by uh, Foster uh, and uh, Partners. Um, the Songdo city, which I showed before, is an example of Cisco systems. So everything is being owned and being implemented by Cisco systems. Mazda city is what we call Siemens city, because it's all Siemens. That is the company. So be aware of this. And uh, it's not considered a, a huge success because it's only partially uh, Realized, but it's actually quite different from uh, from Songdo because Songdo is high rise, while this is more low rise and it's very good, less condensed compact. And it also includes this kind of uh, transportations, like you can see here, which are also at the moment uh, implemented in Heathrow Airport in London. But you might you might be critical about this airport because what is quality of life? Uh, these are the streets of uh, of, uh, of Massa City, and you might be very critical. Well, the third considered uh, smart city in the world is not far away from here, it's actually Rio de Janeiro. And this is also uh, uh, after a speech which was given by the mayor of Rio uh, de Janeiro in, uh, in TEDx. Um, and uh, it is uh, in Rio, the liberation is dedicated especially to safety and to uh, accommodation of, uh, of weather related uh, uh, data combined with uh, traffic and, uh, and weather and uh, security for people. So it's a very top-down way of, uh, of control. You can see there's a lot of people still who have to uh, craft the data. Right? So it's, it's uh, in a way it is smart, but not that smart. So, so far the existing, uh, let's say, 
the existing fabric of smart cities. You might say, you want to read a bit, this is a quote by Hamlet, by Shakespeare, uh, is there something uh, rotten in the state of Denmark? It, there, there's something wrong with this whole movement of smart cities. And I already stated uh, an example. Uh, Siemens is Mother City, Cisco Systems is uh, Songo, Rio de Janeiro is IBM, uh, and so forth. The problem is actually that um, the technology which is used to make our systems fast, uh, fast and effective and uh, uh, smart is um, being owned by these multinationals. And increasingly, actually, the cities, so Rio de Janeiro, Zongo, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, they have this problem that um, they, don't, uh, they don't understand anymore these technologies. They have difficulties in getting grasp at the um, at the technology behind all this data. And uh, so they become dependent on Google. And uh, the other problem is actually that these cities, um, they have contracts with Siemens either or Cisco systems. There are now about 70 different uh, companies like that. And all these um, uh, kingdoms, you might say, so the Siemens, the Googles, they have their own algorithms. And they don't want to share their algorithms with one another because that's their business. And algorithms actually makes so that actually yeah, we have 14 competing standards and in the end they come all, all together, they want one standard, of course, but it's not happening, it's going to become 50 because um, algorithms uh, are their business and they will never share it. So what we are running into is actually, again, what I stated in the beginning, into a world in which the city-states are subdivided by different technologies which do not speak the same language, the same algorithms. That's, that's interesting to know, but it's also something else because that's, that's, that's touching more on uh, today's uh, focus and that's actually that um, physical infrastructure is also involved in this discussion. So, this, so far I, did, I discussed about, a lot about the so-called uh, digital um, revolution, about digital infrastructure, but a good example which is not well known uh, in the world is in San Francisco. You might know that Google is there, it's the main seat of Google in San Francisco. And in San Francisco, Google has its own neighborhoods, their own working places. They have their own buses, they have their own trains now. They have actually, so they're actually changing into so the municipality. This actually has a lateral municipality, the municipality of Google, so to say. But they also use public lanes. This is a protest by people in the streets, because the Google buses actually take, make use of the public lanes, which are paid for by the tax. And in a way, so it's, there's a conflict between this, um, you might say, this, this, this private uh, uh, use of the uh, infrastructure by companies which are powerful, like Google and so forth, and uh, the existing uh, uh, infrastructure for the poor people, for the normal people, let's say, that has been paid for by tax. And this is taking place not only in uh, San Francisco, this is happening in more and more places. I wrote some examples. In, uh, in the book, and this is an example in, in Spain, you have the Hotel Sol in Madrid, the examples in Singapore, this and so forth. So this commerce which takes over, and of course it leads to very nice inventions, eh, because it's nice to have a cup of coffee, because of, uh, some smoke coming out, it's a nice, uh, you know, or uh, have a seating uh, by Ikea on the bus uh, stop. But of course there's a lot, there's a bottom line behind it. Eh, so, uh, Public, uh, public infrastructure is, uh, is taken away, uh, literally sometimes, to start running. Um, what is the other bottom line is that all the smart cities I showed, are all the smart cities which are considered smart in the, in the world, so the Rio de Janeiro, the Singapore, uh, London, Vienna, Amsterdam, they are actually considered also as very expensive cities to live in. So the difference between the poorest and the, the richest is the highest in smart cities. And that's due to this technology, because technology of course costs a lot of money. In 2012, actually the United States was beat by Singapore as being the most diverse, uh, the most uh, uh, unequal society. And uh, this is something which happens all around. This is uh, Rapinha in, uh, in, in Rio, where we were two days ago. And uh, you can see it all around, uh, in this, particularly in uh, smart cities. 
And my statement today, in general in the book, is actually that we should start first to think more actively about existing infrastructure before we start to think about the smartness. Because we spend a lot of money, we make ourselves dependent on technology-based companies, but there is this what we call the right to the city or the right to the infrastructure, as we call it. And the right to infrastructure means that we first should think of good sanitation, good water, which is happening here in Sao Paulo. So I think Sao Paulo makes the right choice instead of Rio inverting, investing a lot of money in the smartness and in the address, but actually the most important is to, uh, to invest in new ways to deal with the other problem, which is much more serious, which is the lack of water and uh, the energy. That's what we call the right to infrastructure. Um, but of course, we should not neglect this movement of smartness. It's not that it's all that I'm kind of against smartness. I have also my smart devices. I'm wearing them as well. And we could do it another way. And I would like to share with you how we could do that. Um, in Amsterdam, we try to put it in one hand. So the smart thing, of course, is the nice thing is that you can sense the city. And right? you can actually, uh, real time, uh, measure differences in use or differences in climate or differences in uh, combination of those. And based on that, you can make your design of metropolitan solutions and in the end you can integrate technology in a way that is not uh, this paradigm of, um, of uh, top down uh, implementation but it's integration based on what another approach. So, um, this real-time me measuring of, of movement, of change, of, of climate, that's, that's something that I consider as something that is really uh, uh, going to change the effectiveness of our, our city. So that's where smart cities are making sense. Because we should find a way how to deal with this, uh, this problem of, uh, of dependence. And of course, they lead to new ways, new perspectives. So this is just an example I gave in the book. But this is about uh, a route in London. It's made by Yahoo Labs in uh, Barcelona. That's, that's the Yahoo think tank. And it's not about the shortest way. Well, of course, I put also the shortest route in, in London. But they also, based on the feedback they got from users, they made the most happiest route, which is this one, the most beautiful route, and the most quiet route. So you can actually, so you can actually um, add quality-based indicators to the quantity. So, so, so far, um, smartness always has been uh, connected to quantification, um, so just about mobility, uh, the amount of mobility, its fastness, the amount of energy use, uh, the amount of users. But this is actually something we should move through. And of course, it can be connected to security, like here in London, Although I must confess that this is, this is the outcome of smart sensing based on, uh, on the most insecure areas in London. But we could have done this as well without this sensing. But it's much more interesting if you cross them, if you cross different databases, like this one in San Francisco, where we cross um, schools, availability of schools, public schools, and crime. So if you, if you combine those two data sets, then it becomes interesting for planning of cities. Because at that moment you can see, hey, this, there's a problem in a certain district, and that's, that needs attention. We need to interfere with infrastructure or with uh, our results in that area. So this is also uh, important. One bottom line again I would like to make is, a lot of people say data is a solution, well, or technology is a solution. Uh, and it's not actually this way. So it's always crafted. It's actually there's no data without any, any value being given by an engineer. And it can also be the value made by an algorithm, of course. So I'm quite critical about this smart city movement. It leads to um, these kingdoms, these cloud kingdoms, uh, often. Uh, and I would like to change, to turn it around. So I would like to. Um, I'm wondering in this room, did anybody of you ever read the. Small letters, small uh, user agreements of your mobile device. I'm sure it did. The first one who comes stands up. Because, uh, no one reads them. Well, you must be amazed. 
try to read, I put the link in uh, Facebook. They can do everything. So it's really amazing. In my, in my view, we should turn it around. So we should ask Amazon permission to use our data. And that's actually something which I call the illuminated city. And it's another way of approach to cities. It's also connected to um, the network theories of uh, Strogatz, of uh, Christopher Alexander, and it made of another way of organization. So we still use uh, smart use technology, but it's actually based on how people are organized, how people in the city, how they interfere, how they actually react to one another. It's a more dynamic and more amorphous uh, way of organization. Self-organization is important. And that's actually something which is shown in this uh, integration in square. But it also makes it more easy to, inter, uh, to integrate in urban areas smart infrastructure which is based on smaller scales of implementation like this uh, bicycle path and this is a solar uh, bike path and you can integrate it more easily than you can connect it. This, uh, this is an example in the Netherlands in, uh, in uh, uh, Romania in which you also made this smart bike path so it's a, it's a bicycle lane which also generates energy I must be honest, it's already broken at the moment, but uh, they are repairing. So this is actually what's making sense. So, so it's another way of organization of bottom-up, but also of top-down, of connecting users. And uh, this is actually uh, what brings me to the, thing, uh, uh, to the next thing, which is actually the, the, uh, how could we use this feedback by data in a smart way into, for instance, uh, uh, effective mobility. And then uh, we made in Delft this example of a uh, smart connection of uh, electricity generation and uh, electrical vehicles. Because actually they have the same problem. So they are both with the same characteristics. They're both low voltage, they're both direct current, and they have a problem of supply uh, demand mismatch. But if you combine the two in a built environment, you can win a lot. Yeah? So you can either uh, use the electrical vehicles, be it bikes or be it cars in the future, hybrid cars or uh, full electrics, they can be used as temporary storage in the real environment. And it's interesting because it makes it you can you need less photovoltaics on your roof, or you can build higher buildings with the same amount of uh, photovoltaics. So actually, the, the you can say the, the business case for sustainable energy uh, technology uh, becomes more efficient. So that's a smart list which uh, is of value, but it should be organized in another way. And it's actually like uh, going in this uh, schematic overview. So, so far we are organizing our cities at this moment with households in a city and actually they are in balance with the national grid for electricity, or a regional grid for sewerage, on a, uh, a waste also on a municipal uh, or a regional scale. But what's actually new is that with smartness, we can actually introduce this in between uh, what we call the interface or interconnection between the users, the use related flows. So, this is, for example, electricity. It uh, can be a microgrid uh, infrastructure. It's based on organic material. It can be uh, uh, a sanitation and vacuum, sanitation, sewerage system connected to anaerobic digestion, so that's implemented on the scale uh, at the neighborhood or city district. And it can be even food production. And then we have something very interesting, because you have an in-between scale level in which you can match the amount of supply. And to give an example, in the Netherlands, people who buy electricity, they pay 21 euro cents per kilowatt hour. But if they produce electricity, they produce, and they produce more than they use, they will give it back to the central grid, but they only get 7%. It's a huge difference. Um, so the smartness is now, if they join as a collection, as a, as a, uh, as a group, as a, as, a, as a community, you could actually sell your electricity for 14 cents to your neighbor, so he has cheaper energy and you have uh, a better price for your energy. That's in, in short, uh, very easy. Uh, business case of these smart grids. And of course, we still need existing uh, balanced grids as a back and callback system, but they don't need to be up 
upgraded and uh, so much money has been used. So we did that actually in, in several plants, in the skip hall and also in, uh, in Rotterdam Stadshaven. And we tried to implement such a, such a scheme into the urban tissue, into the urban area. This is Stadshaven, this is uh, Hamburg actually, in Copenhagen, which we used as an example. In the Merwe Stierhavens in Rotterdam, we did a study how can we make these, these areas in the harbor entirely independent of energy by introducing electrical vehicles. So what we did actually, we actually excluded uh, in each of these uh, uh, harbor uh, uh, figures, we excluded traffic uh, mobility from the uh, urban life. We painted uh, on the outside, so this is where the cars can drive, the public drive, and we parked them in the central part of the city. The rest is all based on bike and foot uh, pedestrian uh, uh, development. And, uh, but we use this also as a battery for the whole urban tissue. And we could actually manage to make this district energy neutral on an average uh, height of uh, four to six stories height. Which is quite special because if you do it on a conventional way like people are doing at the moment, you only would achieve 1.4 stories of uh, neutral because that's what the country more or less is. So you could, you, you could actually win urban compactness and more uh, houses to be built with the same amount. Something like that. So it's at, yeah, to, to come to an ending. It's about uh, a different approach of uh, community. So it's another way of approach. And a very interesting uh, uh, example I gave in the book as well. I would like to tell you is it's also what they call uh, about what they call um, uh, narrative imagination, narrative uh, uh, education. And an example is this. Uh, uh, this uh, Natural fuels made by uh, Westman Haas. And um, how it works is as follows this is a light which people can use until the total amount of electricity used for this light is, being, uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is larger than the carbon that can be sequestrated by these plants. At the moment, the sequestration, uh, the use of carbon is larger, the light will shut off, it will go down. But then there's a connection to the national grid, oh, sorry. To, the, to, the, to the grid, and it actually connects to your neighbors. So the neighbors have also these plants, so you can use their energy, their environmental space. But if you use more than five times your carbon sequestration, sequestration uh, 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 space, at that moment uh, the asset is being released to your plant, and your plants are being built. And of course, this is just an art object. But it tries to tell the story. It tries to tell a story that this is what I told you before. The technology is actually being shown here with the plants. We've been trying to upgrade this kind of system to larger, uh, to larger systems. So what, how, how, how to implement these green systems into the urban tissues? Into the projects I showed last year uh, in Kilmore and before this Rotterdam. How could we do this? And how could we make use of these green areas in a smarter way in the sequestration of carbon, but also in the water and the green blue uh, in the demands? That's what we, uh, therefore, we did a study in the uh, uh, Green City study together with Tanea Brachin and another. And there's another movie I'd like to show just to give you a bit of an outlook of how green blues can be used. The undergoing processes of rapid urbanization of our cities and regions and their expression in intensive land exploitation, fragmentation of natural areas and cycles are ever more unsustainable in the built form. This is essentially defined by a greater sensitivity to the context. Resources are shared across different systems and, as a result, costs are reduced and benefits extended. Here, two pathways can be traced. The first recalibrates the existing infrastructure, redefining spatial strategies to retrofit soft technologies in the existing urban fabric capable to metabolize flows and their management costs for greater climate resilience and livability. The second takes the opportunity of a new city master plan to advance research and practice, designing new spatial processes where natural areas and the built form 
are systematically integrated, thereby offering a higher social and ecological performance. Within the context posed by these two pathways, a three-year international research project, Green Blue Infrastructure for Sustainable Attractive Cities, in the framework of JBI Urban Europe projects, is being developed. It focuses on the development of knowledge and tools required to seize the opportunities arising from future challenges to manage water in a way that facilitates robust, synergistic and multifunctional green urban infrastructure. Karuna in Sweden is our international urban living lab. Karuna is the northernmost and largest municipality of Sweden, located 145 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle and with more than 20,000 kilometers squared of sparsely populated area. Its unique landscape, history and extreme climate set many challenges for its future. Founded in 1900 by the state-owned LKAB mining company, Karuna has grown rich due to the vast seam of iron ore that sits below the town, but is now under risk by the very phenomenon that created its wealth. The mining activity has perforated the subsurface and the city is constantly threatened by subsidence and erosion, problems that are so serious that moving the entire city became a realistic scenario. In the coming decades, the old Karuna will be demolished step by step. At the same time, the city will be rebuilt a few miles eastwards. Strategies for urban transformation include not only changes in the physical environment, but also in governance settings to manage processes within different time frames and varying in size and scope. The new Karuna is expected to be a sustainable and climate resilient city and at the same time, an attractive place from a social and ecological perspective. Green Blue Cities Project is asked to structure these two objectives on the basis of high performative water and green infrastructure, quality of urban space, and of the synergies between nature and city development. The JPI Urban Europe Green Blue Cities Project for the city of Karuna introduces a new urban landscape infrastructure model considering the growing agency of urban ecology in planning and design practices. The proposed green-blue infrastructure is designed based on nested urban landscape networks intertwined with different spatial and temporal scales. The model systematically and spatially defines the role and scope of urban landscape patches and corridors situating the city in its regional and biotic contexts. Dynamic relationships are designed between natural areas and the built form. Water quantity and quality are managed within this system and at the same time supports better places to live, ecosystems and biodiversity in the water-sensitive city. The key to this is the management of water above ground rather than below and the use of green and blue rather than energy and carbon-intensive grey infrastructure. Multiple benefits are expected, not only as outcomes, but, most importantly, are included in the design process, defining future sustainable urban development pathways. Okay, but what we try to see, to show here, that this is actually the focus, like we are trying to do here in this course in, uh, in Sao Paulo. Right? So this is the what we call the hybrid approach, so a mixed grey, blue-green approach towards uh, urban water management. And uh, it also involves, uh, of course, a living, uh, a living lab area, which is, might be a little bit out of, uh, out of context here, because of the Arctic uh, context. It's more uh, a green-white area in that, uh, that context. But, but it shows the approach that even in those extreme climates, we are achieving that it is possible to actually change existing grey infrastructure um, uh, 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 outlines into uh, mixed or hybrid uh, approaches. Like we know, for instance, in this example in, uh, in Freiburg, Poland, uh, or like we know in the Netherlands. And it's also a nice way of in connecting these kind of developments, these green connected uh, developments, with community involvement. Yeah, with urban agriculture, this is the urban agriculture 
in, in, uh, in Rotterdam, Remember Havens, um, uh, Bart. But you have the same actually in New York. Right? It's, like, it's on top of uh, buildings in New York. So these strategies, and this is in Madrid, the Eco Booth Boulevard for the system. And these actually are strategies which find their equilibrium of systems, of introducing systems on a much smaller scale than the systems like I showed you before. And this is actually what's uh, explained in the last chapter of the book, so please take a book if you want. And it's actually how we try to look at smart. This is where I'd like to end. So it's not about smart in a in way of uh, smartness uh, by technology, it's about slow, slowing down uh, patient time, it's about moderate consumption uh, from change from product to service, accepting existing functional objects in aging, empowerment, use of people, and, uh, and involvement of users for maintenance and so forth, and taking the climate the GDG as a starting point. So this is more or less where I would like to uh, end my story. Thank you. Thank you.